Hello everyone and welcome today to today's exclusive webinar, 20 Unmissable Resources for Tracing British and Irish Ancestors. My name is Niall Cullen and my partner in crime on the webinar today is Alex Cox and we're going to be taking you to, through 20 of the best record sets on Find My Past for finding your British and Irish ancestors. And what's important to remember is these are 20 record sets that you won't find anywhere else. They're exclusive to Find My Past. Another important thing today is the fact that this is a subscriber-only webinar. We usually open them up to everyone, but today you are the lucky lot who are Find My Past subscribers. So we want to make sure that you're looking at the record sets that are most important for, for British and Irish family history, and you know how to search them and what you can get out of them. A couple of things to run through today just before we get started, um, a bit of housekeeping. Um, the Q&A box is on your screen at the side and we have a team on hand who will be able to answer your questions as we run through the, through the webinar, so feel free to pop your questions in there. Um, if you're having any issues with your sound, which sometimes people do, rest assured the sound is working at our end, so just make sure your volume is turned up all the way to the max. And there's a little media player widget on your screen as well which you can click and if that's not clicked, once you click it, the sound should work. The slides are available to download um, from the webinar for, under the resource list where you can also visit the website. And after the webinar, we'll also send you an email inviting you to watch the presentation again on demand, which means if there is any issues with your sound or watching it back, you'll have another chance to watch it anyway. So we have 20 great record sets to get through today, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to pass you over to Alex, who's going to take you through 10 fantastic British record collections. Lovely. Hello. Thanks for the intro, Niall. Hi, it's Alex. You may well know me from uh, the Facebook Live videos on Friday. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. Yeah, so as Niall said, I'm going to be trying my best to talk you through 10 unmissable British resources in the next 25 minutes or so. So as you can imagine, that's quite a lot to get through in quite a short space of time. So I will pretty much just kind of lightly be touching on what's included, kind of what you can discover, and, and why they're so great, really. And yeah, as Niall mentioned earlier, um, the, the sets I'll be focusing on are mostly exclusive to us. Um, if they're not totally ex exclusive, elements of them are, or you definitely won't find them in a similar quality or quantity as you will on Find My Past. But anyway, so without further ado, as, as we are pressed for time, I'll get started with... Oh, give another slide... UK Parish Collections, um, quite a hard one to miss, but I didn't want to skip them because they are so important. So, um, for those of you that aren't aware, parish records are church records um, of typically baptisms, bands, marriages and burials, important life events that will pass through parish churches throughout England and Wales. Um, and the reason they are so brilliant is because they are essential for taking your research back before civil re registration. So, any birth, marriage or death pre 1837, Parish is the place to look. Um, so a few quick facts about them. One of the great things about Parish records is how, how far they stretch back. So they generally date back to 1538. You will find some older ones here and there, but as a general rule, they tend to start in 1538. And that's due to an interesting little piece of history. Um, that uh, dates back to Henry VIII's split with Rome. So the chap you'll see on the right-hand slide of the um, right-hand side of the slide there, that's good old Thomas Cromwell, um, Henry VIII's master fixer and the brain behind parish registers. So he passed a law in 1837 that said that every parish church in, in the country had to record all these events that passed through, and as with many things in British history, that was for tax reasons. He realised that having a complete record of everyone who was born, married and died in the country meant that you could tax them a lot more effectively. Um, so the availability of parish records does differ from county to county. Uh, on the next slide, I'll give you a bit of an overview of what we've got. Um, we do have the largest collection online, I believe. That's true, isn't it, now? It is indeed. Um, but yeah, the, one of the, not only are they great because they, because they date back so far, they are a really excellent way of uncovering the previous generation's details because parish baptisms and marriages will virtually, well, in, in nine out of ten cases, nearly always, include the name of at least one parent, usually the father, but in some cases it'll include the names of both parents. So, just to give you an idea, here's a bit of a coverage map, so what's available on Find My Past. All those glorious counties lit up in orange are covered by our collections, um, and we've also, as you can see at the bottom, more are coming. So that's another thing I wanted to add. We add new records every single week, and our parish collection is always growing. So if you come online and the area you're looking for isn't covered at the moment, that's not to say that it won't be in the near future. So if you're after a county that hasn't been covered 
by us yet. Watch this space and keep coming back. But yeah, as you can see there, we're particularly strong in places like Devon, Yorkshire. We've got a fantastic collection for Yorkshire. Kent, Devon, you can see it all there. So anyway, so here are some examples of what you can expect to find when you're looking at a parish register. Some dates to watch out for are, even though they originally started in 1538, they, they really started in earnest in 1597. Uh, and that's because initially, as you can imagine, people, people sussed that this was going to lead to more taxes. So let's just say vicars and local communities could be fairly lax uh, in keeping these records. All has changed when Elizabeth I uh, turned her attention towards them. and She, she declared that the, uh, they were of per magnus usus, basically permanent use, and decreed that from, from, that, from 1597 onwards, all books must be kept in, uh, all red records, sorry, must be kept in properly kept books of parchment leaves, uh, which is why we've got a fantastic long surviving run of parish records dating back to, to that period. Uh, another key date to watch out for is the English Civil War. So um, you'll often, you, might have, you might have heard before of the Civil War gap. So obviously between 1643 and 1647, Britain was uh, you know, in the grips of a bloody, bloody civil war. And as you can imagine, the country was in chaos. So lots of churches were abandoned, uh, some were even damaged or burnt to the ground. Um, and you know, being distracted by trying to survive a war, lots of vicars just or priests didn't find the time to, you know, keeping well-maintained records wasn't high on their agenda, um, which is completely understandable. So you may well hit, you may well struggle. That, that's where I've got stuck on my mother's side. I've, I've hit the Civil War gap. Um, but yeah, something to look out for. Uh, another date uh, is 1812, and that's when the Rose Act was passed. It had a really lengthy title. It was called the Act for Better Regulating and Preserving Parish and Other Registers of Births, Baptisms, Marriages and Burials in England. I'm glad I got all that, got that out all in one. Um, so if you look at these images here, the register on the left, which is a baptism, that's pre-Rose Act, that's pre-1812. So as you can see, it's quite, you know, quite a hard to decipher, just long, long list of information, you know, not really laid out in any clear format. But the other registers are post-Rose Act, and as you can see, they're neatly, neatly ordered into little you know, into columns. There's much more information recorded than previous. Um, and yeah, that, that's because the king's, following the act, the king's printer formally issued books that were sent to the parishes, so then they were uniform. And, you know, um, they, they all looked pretty similar. So things to expect, you know, baptisms will tell you, you know, it'll give you an idea of where your answer, when and where your ancestor was born, obviously, um, and where and when they were baptised. But more importantly, it will give you the names of both parents and father's occupation in many cases, and in some cases, parents' residence as well. Um, bands, so the, the, the top image in the centre is a record of bands. So bands is an ancient legal tradition. Uh, where a couple would announce their intention to marry on three consecutive Sundays in their parish church. That just gave anyone in the community the opportunity to raise any objections they might have. And, you know, it was designed to kind of pre prevent bigamous marriages and that sort of things. Um, so an important thing to note about bans is they, they were purely the intent, the announcement of the intention to marry. So just because you find a, a bans record doesn't necessarily mean that the marriage took place. So who knows, you might even find some evidence of some failed relationships in your ancestor's life, which is, you know, Rather interesting little bit of information. But um, yeah, so with marriages, again, you'll get parents' names, residence condition on marriage, which will be marital status. So, you know, you're, you might, your ancestor might have been a widow or a widower when they got married. Even more rare, a divorcee, but that's very, that would be very uncommon the further back you go. Um, but the other great thing about marriages is you often get the names of witnesses included as well. And that can be really helpful because witnesses are often family members or, or close family friends. And it can just give you an idea of, you know, you know you're having your ancestors' social circle or, or the community in which they lived. Um, and then on the far right, you've got a post-Rose Act burial. Burials contain a little bit less information than you'd expect in a bar uh, um, baptism or marriage, but they're still great because they give you a snapshot of your ancestor in the final years of their life. Uh, it'll tell you where they died, when they died, um, where they were laid to rest, and in many cases, the officiating minister, which you'll often find in actually across baptisms and marriages as well. So that is uh, oh, one thing to add before I move past uh, parish, because I know I need to get cracking on. Uh, bishops' transcripts and archdiocese deacons' transcripts. Um, so every year, pa uh, between 1598 to the mid-1800s, uh, parishes were required by law to send copies of these registers to the bishop. Um, these are great if the registers you're after aren't online yet or haven't survived. So bear in mind bishop's transcripts if you can't find a parish register for any particular reason. Um, finding any of these county collections, go to our A to Z, type in the area and see what comes up.
So, brilliant. On to next, the 1939 Register, a fascinating record set. It was a big coup for us when we released that about two years ago. Um, so, what what is the 1939 Register? Uh, I like I like uh, the description, the, a wartime doomsday book, because that, that's literally what it was. It was an, an incredible exercise in record taking. It recorded the entire civilian population of England and Wales on the eve of the Second World War. So it was uh, it was taken on the 29th of September. That was National Registration Day, and war was only declared on the September 3rd. Because so you can see that they sprung into action very clear, very quickly. And this arose from the government's need to have a detailed, accurate picture of everyone who was in the country and what they were doing. So you know this would go on to be used for rationing, conscription. Very importantly, you know you don't want to be sending all your coal miners off to war because then you'll have a problem sourcing coal or send all your farmers off. Um, and also, very importantly, national security as well. There was a war on, espionage was a concern. So the, th the register was, was instrumental in introducing rationing and, um, and issuing identity cards as well. But the reason it's so significant is it plugs a vital 30-year gap. So the 1931 census was sadly destroyed. I believe it was destroyed during the Blitz. The 1941 census was never taken because there was a war on. And we have quite a long time to wait for the 1951 census to come online because of the 100-year closing rule. So if you're looking to find your ancestors during this period, there really isn't anywhere else to look. And nothing, nothing fills that gap like the 39 register. Another reason it's brilliant is because it's so incredibly accurate. Because uh, it was used for identity cards, rationing, conscription. The government really did need to get a completely accurate idea of what people were doing. So unlike censuses, in the sense that, you know, householders would fill in their own forms so you could they could put anything down for their occupation. So you'll often find quite silly entries. Um people had to put down exactly what they were doing. And for that reason, you've got over 9 million registered occupations, which is a lot, uh, and also exact dates of birth, including day and, you know, day and month as well, which is, you know, you don't get in many family history records. Uh, another thing I must add as well is that some records are redacted. Um, and that is because um, it was a living document up until the mid-90s. It was used as the foundation for our beloved National Health Service. And um, for that reason, it was continuously being updated. Um, that, so because of that, obviously a lot of the people captured by the register are still alive. We can't publish their details online publicly. So any, we, we work off the assumption that anyone born over 100... Oh, working, I'm trying to work this out. Anyone we assume to still be alive has been redacted. But that's not to say that you can't have these records opened up. But I'll talk, I'll talk about that. Um, on one of my next slides. So this is our 39 search page. Um, you can, this is a very quick general search here, but you can do a far more advanced search um, if you click on the little icon there. You can also do an address search because the, the register is brilliant for home history as well. So you can find out who was living there in the 30s. Um, a little bit of uh, factual information about it, just to give you an idea of the scale of the thing. When, when they started, over 40 million people were recorded. Uh, in more than 65,000 volumes. So as you can see, it really was vast. Um, here is what you'll see on, on, a th on one of the registration forms. Um, not too dissimilar from a census. You've got the names of all the people in the household. Um, you've got OVSPI. Num um, th those are codes for institutions, really. So they'd, o, o would be officer, V would be visitor, S would be servant, P would be patient, and I would be inmate. So particularly for things like hospitals or asylums or prisoners, you, you'll get OV, uh, OVSPI numbers if you're wondering what they refer to. Uh, you've got their gender, you know, what, exactly when they were born and their personal occupation. I love this record here because the eagle-eyed of you among the eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed that this is for Buckingham Palace and it's the household of His Majesty the King. Uh, I love to imagine the conversations that would have been had when the enumerator turned up there. So um, this is what you get um, on the transcript page. It, you know, pretty closely mirrors the information you see in the image. What you may have noticed in the image I just showed you was there was a black bar towards the bottom. That is a prime example of what a redacted, what a redacted record looks like. Um, and if you do find one of those and you want it opened, if you can see here at the bottom of the transcript, you've got buttons to open a closed record, request a living person's record, or close an open record. So if you click on any of them, it'll give you a bit more information about exactly what you need, you, you need to do to get those opened or closed. So, and 
finally, for 1939, I just wanted to highlight the fact that it's um, our first ever enhanced record set. So if you scroll past down that transcript, you get tons more information than you were probably bargaining on. So you get three Ordnance Survey maps, one for the time when the register was taken, one for, I believe, around 1914, and one for the present day. So there's a pin showing you where your ancestor's house was. You can flip between those and it, you know, see how the areas changed. You'll also get newspaper articles from the period and from the area, just give you a little bit more contextual information. Some lovely photos uh, from the Trinity Mirror Collection, just giving you a visual idea of what life was like in 1939. And these infographics, which I think are fascinating. You can toggle between them to compare the registration district or county district to the country as a whole, and it'll just give you a really good idea of what the area was like. So you can compare demographic splits for age and gender. You can find out the most common surnames, most common occupations by, for males and females, average household size, that sort of thing. So certainly have a play with, around with them because they're very interesting. Right, I'm going to start speeding up now because I've uh, been laboring some points and Niall's looking concerned. So next, England and Wales electoral registers. Um, Oh, that's what I must add. So the 1939 register um, was released in partnership with our lovely friends over at the National Archives. The electoral registers were released with more great friends of ours, the British Library. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about these was because I do think they're quite commonly overlooked and they're so big, uh, but they're mainly they're just a fantastic census substitute. So as you can see here, it's the largest single collection on Far My Past, recording approximately 220 million names of voters, you know, huge. Uh, spans the years 1832 to 1932, so probably the most important 100 years in the history of British democracy. Those are the years that the electorate the electoral really started to grow. So, you'll, you know, you'll see the change to the electorate um, electoral after women won the vote and after the restrictions related to property were lifted. And as you'd imagine then, you can also determine when your ancestor won the right to vote. Um, so here is what you'll see when you look at an electoral register. There's the image there. They don't provide tons of information. They'll tell you where your ancestor was living um, at that time and also give you an idea and tell you why they were eligible to vote. Um, so as you can, on the left there, you've got all the, um, the codes, uh, which, which after 1918 will tell you exactly what, what qualified them to vote. You know, throughout history, it was very often tied to property, and sometimes wives could vote through, you know, through their husband's qualifications, things like that. So have a read through them, and they'll provide you with a lot more information. Um, and then in the kind of middle of the screen, that little white box, that's the transcript box, uh, which will summarize the essential information when you're looking at these records. One quick, one quick thing to add, um, these records are a PDF search, not an index. Um, and that is because the collection is so big. So it uses OCR, which is optical character recognition. Um, so the search operates slightly differently. So if you search for, say, John and Smith, it won't just bring you back John Smith. It'll bring you up every instance of John and Smith on that page. So look out for that. But the reason we use that is because it, um, it allows us to make huge quantities of records searchable. If you think about it, indexing 220 million names would take years. So that's, that's why we've opted for OCR. Um, so it has its perks, but it also has its quirks. So watch out for those. Two last things. Um, they're great for house history. They were taken, um, rather than being taken every 10 years like a census, they were taken every year, sometimes biannually. So brilliant for tracing your ancestors' movements between the census years and also finding out who lived in your home you know, over the past 100-odd years. Um, and another thing to watch out for as well is that constituencies change. Obviously, these are arranged by constitu constituencies. And throughout history, consist constituencies have widely fluctuated, particularly in London. But um, on the search page, you'll, in the useful link section, you'll find the British Library's parliamentary constituencies and their registers since 1832 guide, which will tell you everything you need to know. So, moving swiftly on. Schools. I, I'm very fond of school records because they give us a rare snapshot of our ancestors' lives in childhood. Because if you think about it, records, we tend to follow the records and skip from birth straight to marriage. And everything that happens in between in those early years often get lost often gets lost, but not with school records. So it's a vast collection, over 8.4 million records spanning 1870 to 1914. And it was the product of a really quite groundbreaking initiative where, you know, because it contains records from 41 counties, so England and Wales, but it was a landmark project where we got loads of archives from schools, record offices and county archives from England all together to get this really important resource up online. Um, and there is two main types of records you'll find. Admission registers, um, um, they are literally, they do what they say on the tin. They're registers of admission. But they'll also give you biographical details and some, you know, dates and 
dates and dates relating to their attendance at school, and logbooks, which are basically school diaries, really, and record notes or inf incidences that recurred in the school or the wider community that had an impact on the school. So, the, one, the image on the left here is a typical school register. So, you know, as you can see here, you've got the name of the pupil, uh, the date. You've also got um, their residence and their parents' names. So, you know, the parents' names are really great, actually, for identifying the child, because what you'll find sometimes is you might need to whittle down some results so you can use parents' names to do that. Um, but a little bit of extra information. Images, apart, the amount of information will differ depending on the school and when the record was taken. But some of the extra things you can expect to find in the, Im in the images, that's the, always look at images. Or every set I'm talking about today has transcripts and images. But I must say, always look at the images because you'll find so much more. Uh, images can give you all kinds of extra details, such as um, your, the, that, your ancestor's father's occupation, any previous schools they attended and their reasons for leaving that school, um, any details of illnesses or reasons for absence while they're attending the school. And you know, sometimes you might even find exam results. So as you can see, really lovely little snippets of information about your ancestors' school years, which you really just can't find anywhere else. Logbooks are probably they're good for grabbing colour and getting an idea of the world in which your ancestors lived. So as you can see here, the teacher's writing about how 50 children were, only 50 children were present on Friday afternoon, and many of those that were in school appeared to be very ailing. So he's talking about an epidemic that's sweeping through the school. And, you know, you'll find ones from the First World War years saying how absences of teachers who've gone off to fight in France are affecting lessons and things like that. So, you know, really lovely contextual information you can dig out of those. So, next, prisoners of war. So, the reason I wanted to talk about prisoners of war, not only is it because it's such a massive collection, but because it, it's got those incredibly rare, rare World War II military records. You know, I'm sure many of you where it's quite hard to get hold of World War II military records because service records are still held by the MOD and you need to write off and get permission. But this collection is one way of finding your World War II ancestors if they were captured, uh, that, that I must add. So it's an enormous collection which spans 1745 to 1945 and it covers the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the, Napoleonic Wars the Crimean War, the Anglo-Boer War and both World Wars. Um, it includes a myriad of papers from the Foreign Office, Colonial Office, War Office, all kinds of sources, and it covers every single branch of the armed forces. So that's Army, Navy, and Air Force. But not just that. You will also find uh, thousands of civilians in there. So, you know, diplomats, missionaries, aid workers, anyone who was in an area of conflict and got captured by enemy forces. So... Um, I've just put some examples here to kind of show you what some of the different types look like. And I really don't have enough time, sadly, to go into how varied this collection is. You know, you'll find all sorts. You'll find lists of the names of prisoners in camp registers. In others, you'll find detailed accounts of daily life in camps. Include, you know, some, will, some might include physical descriptions of your ancestors. And obviously, they, lots of them will include those all-important biographical details. The one on the top left there is for Eric Lomax, um, who you name might ring a bell. Uh, Eric Lomax is the railway man. Uh, great film and great book. Um, so that there is his Japanese index card. Fant fascinating, because as you can see, these were cards made by the Japanese, and you've got the Japanese script on there. Um, and it gives his rank, his parents' address, so his address back in the UK, his next of kin, his re you know the regiment he was with, uh, and his date of birth. Um, the one on the right is an officer's, um, a list of officers in a German POW camp. Unfortunately, I cut off the wrong section, but that one does include Douglas Bader uh, from Reach from the Sky, the famous uh, fighter pilot. Uh, the one on the bottom left is an example of a World War I prisoner record. It lets you see a little bit more sparse in detail. And the one on the right is from the bottom right is from the Napoleonic Wars. Quick one to add about the Napoleonic War era ones is they mostly relate to prisoners held by the British, not, prisoner, pris not British prisoners, whereas the others are focused more on British prisoners. So you'll get lots of um, French or and D Dutch, uh, some Americans from the War of 1812 in there as well. So really fascinating, very collection. But to really get the idea of what's in there, you need to have a play around yourself. So, similarly, moving on, military service records. These are probably my favourite record set on Find My Past because I've found, when I have found one to my ancestor, it's given me so much more than I bargained for. British Army uh, are, I would, it's fair to say, the most detailed by a long shot. It's a huge collection, over 8 million, dating back to 1760. Um, doesn't cover the Second World War, as I mentioned earlier, the MOD still have those, but it includes all sorts of forms, you know, attestation papers, those are the papers they would have signed when they joined up, medical forms, discharge documents, pension claims, proceedings of regimental boards, 
We've also got Royal Navy service and pension records. These also call, cover the Royal Marines. Um, these are mainly, well, they are pension records, so they tend to capture your ancestor at the end of their military career, uh, but there's some great details you can pull out of those. And last but not least, small, smallest collection in the bunch, but that's because this service branch has been going the shortest, the shortest period of time, uh, Royal Flying Corps, Royal Air Force records. So we've got two main collections, Airmen Service Records, 1912 to 1939, um, and that covers the First World War, um, and officer service records, 1912 to 1920, also covering the First World War. Um, quick thing to bear in mind for um, those is an airman is basically, an airman's a ger generic term for anyone in the RAF, whether they flew or not. An officer, as you'd imagine, is, is an officer, that doesn't need explaining. So um, here, what I've, got, what I've got here in front of you is an example of a British Army service record. And this is only the first three pages. <laughs> Honestly, some of these just go on and on and on. I found one for my great-grandfather, and it was about 30 pages. And it, you know, it was like basically finding a biography for him. It told me everything. It told me where he trained as an apprentice, where his parents were living, detailed phys a character reference. And then when I got towards the end, it listed every single injury he received and where he was hospitalized. And the poor chap had a terrible war. But, you know, so, so much information there. The one I've got here is for George Rose, who is a very interesting character. He was a the most decorated black soldier of the Napoleonic Wars. He was an escaped slave from Jamaica who served with distinction under Wellington and was very badly wounded at the war Battle of Waterloo. But um, he, after the war, he went back to Jamaica, became a missionary and had an incredibly fascinating life. So if you ever want a quick read, look up George Rose. But um, So the first page, attestation form, would give a physical description. It would um, also, you know, kind of say where he's from, but all those kind of important biographical details. Um, the last page... It gives you an idea of what the, the service history pages would look like. So it would tell you where he was stationed, how long he served there, and things like that. But you also find pension details and, you know, next of kin. Um, but anyway, I'd best move on because time is running out. So here you have uh, an example of one of our naval pension records. Um, that, so they record two kinds of pensions, out pensions, which were awarded to veterans who were living independently, and in pensions, and they, they, those were pension, pensioners who were living in the Royal Hospital in Greenwich, who were often referred to as Greenwich geese by the locals. Um, so the reason that I'd say these records are so great is because of Britain's long maritime history. Um, if you've got British ancestors, there's a good chance that at least one of them served in the Royal Navy at some point, um, and these are the records to find them in. Um, let's just see if I've missed anything about the Navy ones. No, I think... Think. Oh yeah. So just to tell you what they tell you, I should I should explain that actually. So they'll give you details of their service history, dates. You know, if they if they die, it'll provide you with that, details about that, so like death and th the dates and things. Um, the images will give you extra information, such as the amount of pension they received if they were if if their next of kin were receiving it. It'll list their next of kin um, and additional no remarks, which could be noted to awards or wounds or you know anything really. So certainly have a look through them if you suspect you've got naval ancestors and last but not least uh, here is a RAF service record for Billy Bishop who was a World War One fighter ace um, these records can give you quite a, lot, quite a lot of information actually both the officers and the airmen ones so they'll give you uh, birthplace the, uh, the, the serviceman's birthplace their civilian occupation uh, their religious denomination next of kin and also details relating to their military life such as when they joined their service number details of their training special special qualifications decorations medical results it, yeah it kind of it varies so just get exploring and see what you find i really need to hurry up now don't i now Right, oh no, I've got to one of the most interesting ones, and time is short. Crime, crime. If you have criminal ancestors, find my past, it's a place to visit. So our crime, prisons, and punishment collection, also released in partnership with the National Archives, is vast. It records over 5.7 million victims, villains, and law enforcers. That's everyone from your Georgian highwaymen to your you know, Edwardian poacher to your early trade unionist, Victorian murderers. They're all in there. Um, who passed through the criminal justice system in England and Wales between 1770 and 1935. Again, this is a real mixed bag that I'm not going to be able to do, give ju do justice in a couple of minutes because there's 22 series in there, which uh, if you go to the bottom of the search page, it'll explain in a bit more detail what they cover and what they include. Um, but yeah, you can find all sorts, from physical descriptions to photographs, as you can see there on the right. I think those are mugshots from Newgate, uh, Newgate Prison, uh, prison registers, records of executions, transportation. So if, if you're Australian and you think your ancestors might have been transported, great place to look. Correspondences between judges, you know, petitions for clemency filed by family members, 
records for prison hulks, all sorts. But I'll very, very quickly show you some examples. Here is a typical prison register or a calendar of prisoners, uh, which is basically like a prison census. It lists everyone who's in the prison, why they're there, uh, where and when they were sentenced, and what they've been sentenced to. So at the bottom there, you've got a very notori notorious Victorian um, murderer called Amelia Dyer, who uh, was responsible for the murder of many babies in a in an exercise called baby farming which is very tragic but as you can see she was um sentenced to death so here these are my favorite in the series these are um, licenses uh we've got male and female licenses and licenses were essentially licenses to be at large so parole records they were made when the prisoner was leaving prison um, as you can see, they're very detailed. They act almost like a little prison service record. So they'll tell you exactly which prisons your ancestor was sent to, how long they were sent there. Physi they'll include a physical description, details of their character, or if they had any medical problems. But it'll all, some of them will also tell you if your ancestor filled out any specific roles within the prison. So if they, you know, if they helped with the cooking or cleaning or something like that. But the best part is post. 18, I think it's from the 1870s onwards, you get a second page which will include a mugshot, which you can see there on the left. And you can see how they often held their hands up. That was because um, criminals were often identified by their hands, because, you know, obviously many would work in very you know, manual, dangerous industrial jobs. Many were missing fingers or many had tattoos. Uh, but they'll also include other interesting bits related to the case. So as you can see here, you've got a newspaper clipping, um, which if I could zoom in, I'd read it, but I can't. But you know, it'll obviously describe this chap's offence and, and his trial. So yeah, very, very detailed records and very interesting. Last but not least, another one I really like. These are registers of habitual criminals. And these were <coughs> basically um, re documents put out to uh, you know, business owners, landlords, and police officers telling them who to keep an eye out for. So people who are frequently in trouble with the law. So the one on the left is one that's pre-photography. So obviously they weren't able to include photographs of the, um, of the per alleged perpetrators. Um, but they do, so they, they, they'd include, you know, name, uh, description at time of discharge, so exactly what they look like, um, and remarks on any peculiars or distinguishing marks. Um, so if your ancestor was in that of prison, you might find them in there. But the one on the right is an example of the ones that were issued post when you know, following the introduction of photography, and they're just fascinating. They'll give you, and you know, what you'll see is a lot of these people were at the very lowest rungs of society. They were street vendors, in many cases prostitutes and drunks. Um, quite some tragic stories in there, but you can put faces to the names. So very, very interesting collections. I could talk at eight. I could do a whole webinar on crime. So I'm going to move on. All right. Um, British in India. Again, released in partnership with our friends at the British Library. I'll very quickly skim over these, but the reason I wanted to mention them was because, you know, they are, you won't find them anywhere else. Um, and if your ancestors did go over to India, um, which an astonishing number of Britons did, this is the place to look. So there you've got a brief list of the kind of things that you'll find in there. Um, you know, as you can see, it stretches all the way back to, 16, to 1698, right up to when India got independent in 1947. So it covers both eras of British rule. That was when the East India Company was in charge and the British Raj. Um, they cover the three main presidencies. So that's Bengal, Bombay and Madras. But you'll also, you'll also, they also cover other regions which were connected to the India office. So that's the likes of Aden, Burma, Kuwait, the princely states, St. Helena, the list goes on. Um, but yeah, if you go to the search forms for these, you'll find out more information. Um, and yeah, they're just fantastic for shedding light on um, the careers and family lives of expats, you know, the significance of the East India Company, uh, you know, the offices of power, what life was like out of there. And they really do cover all walks of life. So you'll get lowly company privates to wealthy merchant princes to the highest ranking members of the East India Company, civil service and armed, for um, armed forces, as well as, you know, non-official inhabitants, such as, like, you know, your planters, your missionaries and your free mariners. But the example I wanted to include here was a British and India burial record. Um, so your baptisms and burials look quite similar to the parish records you'd find in the UK. But the reason the Indian burial records are so fantastic because they include cause of death, which is a rare thing indeed. So as you can see here, these poor, these poor people died of dropsy, apoplexy, a fractured skull, and diarrhea. You'll find more exotic ones in there, like bitten by cobra or crushed by elephant. But, you know, tragically, things like diarrhea, dysentery, and malaria appear to be some of the most common killers. So I will be very quick now. Now I'm meeting into your time. Employment records. Sorry, I just really quickly whizzed past that intro slide. Um, for those of you that missed that, I'm talking about employment records. So these mainly consist of apprenticeship records, um, you know, which allow you to discover your ancestors' trade, who they trained with, and the names of their parents. 
Uh, Guild and Trade Union records, uh, these are exclusive to us. These cover the historic livery companies and date back to the 16th century. Also, our mer merchant navy and maritime records. These are great because, as I mentioned earlier, Britain has such a long maritime history. Um, and these basically allow you to find out if your ancestors did work on the high seas, which I'm sure many of your ancestors did. Uh, and we've also got a variety of re you know, regional occupation and profession records, so like county lists of clergy and things like that. So you can find them by going to our A to Z, A to Z, A to Z, A to Z section and uh, popping in some keywords and seeing what comes back. So very quickly talking through these. Uh, county Apprentice, we've, you, the two big collections you'll be using, uh, Britain County Apprentices, 1770 to 1880. Um, these are basically tax records that masters have to pay on the indentures for an apprentice. Uh, quick thing to note, an average apprentice was seven years. So if you find your ancestors in these, you've got an idea of you know, how long they'd be doing this for. Uh, they'll reveal parents' names, where the, where the apprentice came from, his father's trade, and details of the master he trained under and the trade he, he chose. And they're great because you'll find lots of children who otherwise would have followed their father's professions going into other professions. So, you know, if you find children missing from an early cent... Oh, actually, no, these are pre cents so ignore that. Um, but, yeah, very, very interesting records. Um, and even more interesting are Guild and Freeman records. These uh, cover the historic livery companies of the City of London. At the moment, we've got haberdashers, gunmakers, ironmongers, um, and oath rolls, which were basically an oath that livery companies had to sign to King Charles following the English Civil War. Um, so, they'll, again, they'll tell you when your ancestor was admitted to the company, how they were admitted, and the name of their master, and also whether they became a freeman. Um, so that'll give you an idea if you know your ancestor's status and standing. Uh, and they date back to the early 1500s, as I mentioned earlier. And one final quick fact, one of our oldest collections on the site, probably, is our City of York Apprentice and Freeman records, which date all the way back to 1272. So if you have ancestors from York, be sure to check them out, because who knows, you, you, know, you might be getting back to the 13th century. And last but not least, I have overrun, but I've, oh no, this isn't last but not least, um, the second, second slide. So Britain trade union members, again, they do what they say on the tin. They'll tell you whether your ancestor was a member of a trade union. Uh, they cover 250 unions across the country, uh, and they can give you little snippets of family information, such as whether they applied for funeral benefit or whether they transferred to a new branch and moved their family. Um, last, then Merchant, C, Merchant Navy records. Um, these are fantastic because they can give you loads of detail about your Merchant Navy ancestors. Um, three big collections there you want to look at the 1835 to 1857 uh, records the 1918 to 1941 to the interwar records and the crew lists from 1861 to 1913 they recorded marriages engagements births and deaths at sea as well so they're very very they can you know they're very useful um, if you can't find a birth marriage or death in the UK who knows it could have happened at sea um, favourite is the middle set, Merchant Navy Seaman 1918-41, because they will include physical descriptions and photographs. So that's what you can see there on the bottom right. You've got the first, first, card, first page of the card, which gives you the description and details about their nationality and where they're from, and then the image. Right, I'm going to do this last slide really quickly because I am eating into Niall's time. Um, early travel and migration records. So we've got, um, you've got early immigration to Barbados. Britain registers of licenses to pass beyond the seas, 1573 to 1677. Uh, Royal Africa Company records and early emigration from Britain, 1636 to 1815. It's the second and final set, so I'm going to focus on mainly, uh, because the early immigration Britain, because uh, early immigrants from Britain, um, again, because they date so far back, so you know you'll get some of the earliest American settlers in there, and they consist of colonial papers, naturalisation books, you know, registers, all sorts, and they they really mainly cover travel to the West Indies, Canada, and the American colonies. Uh, and as you can see there at the bottom, they'll tell you who, you, what ship your ancestors sailed on, where, when they sailed, where they sailed from and to, and you know things like their residence back in England and their um, occupation. And finally. Um, registers of licenses to pass beyond the seas. These are more about short-term travel, so people who were travelling and then intending to come back. Uh, so after 1609, all travellers over the age of 18 had to swear an oath of allegiance to the monarch, and then they were issued a licence to pass beyond the seas. Uh, these issues were these licences had to be used quickly. None of them had a deadline, so um, the dates recorded won't tell you the dates of travel. They'll tell you when the oath was signed and when the licence was issued, but they'll give you a good idea of when they were going to be travelling. And yeah, these mainly cover voyages to continental Europe, particularly Belgium and Holland, Ireland and the Americas. So these will help you find out if your ancestors had any international business dealings. So that was me. I'm nearly out of breath. I'm sorry, Niall, for running over. Now Niall's going to have to go frantic. Um, I will hand you back over.
Right, thanks, Alex. I think everyone um, can see how passionate you are about <laughs> family history from that. So obviously, we could do a whole webinar on a number of those record sets, but today is really just about kind of touching on them lightly, making sure you know about all the great record sets on Find My Path. So I'm going to charge on through the list of the ten unmissable Irish resources. Uh, can overrun a little bit. We can, we, uh, yeah, we can actually. Alex has just mentioned that we were able to overrun because we've extended the webinar out a little bit. So if you can manage to stay around for past over an hour, we can stay around as well. So let's see how long this takes us. I'll, I'll do my best to be fast, but also concise. So the first one is um, the Landed Estates Court Rentals, 1850 to 1885. Now these are exclusive to find my past, and the, the, they're a land record basically, but what you might think of, of, of an Irish land record in the 19th century, you probably think of Griffith's valuation. This, I think, is kind of the less known cousin of um, Griffith's valuation in that it's also a land record, it's also a land survey. There's over half a million records in there covering 8,000 estates across Ireland, and the, the things you get in the, these records are, are basically the same information that you would get from Griffith's valuation. So you get the tenant's name, the location, which is key, obviously, for Irish family history research, and the parish, barony, county, electoral division and the landlord's name as well. You'll also get maps, which I can show you on some of the slides. So this is what the search page would, would look like for the landed estates court rentals. You can access that from the A to Z of records on the site. So this is just an example that I have in. James Coughlin from Cork is the information that I've entered onto the search page. This is the results I would get back. Um, if I click into one of the records then, it's the transcript first of all, giving you the basic information, his name, the year, whereabouts it was recorded. And then if I click into the actual image on the um, on the search results, this is the type of image that you would get. So it does look very similar to Griffith's valuation, but it is a different record set. And again, it's, it, these, this record set is, is kind of vital for the 19th century in Ireland because it re, obviously we don't have censuses in Ireland. They've all been destroyed in the 19th century. So you need census substitutes, and this is one of the key things that you can use. Um, a, to a top tip for using this record set, when you click into any image on it, there will be several pages. So click, make sure you click through them all. Don't just look at the first page, click through them all, and you might get something like this, which is a, an actual map of the area. Moving on to number 12 on our countdown, the Irish Prison Registers, 1790 to 1924. Now this record set, again, can be quite a good census substitute for 19th century Ireland. You can see that obviously that, that year range, it covers is all of the 19th century, so it's fantastic for that. But what's better about it, again, is um, how detailed it is. So on top of the, the basic genealogical, genealogical details that you'll get, like name and address and ages and place of birth, you'll get things like physical descriptions, next of kin, the details of the crime and the name of the victims, sentence dates, etc. So just like the crime records that Alex was talking about, this is the type of stuff that really kind of adds color to your family tree. And if you find a black sheep in the family, you're going to get a lot of information about them from this record set. Again, this is a look at the search page for the Irish Prison Registers, an example that I put in a Robert Cosgrove searching for. Um, here's the search results, and if I click in to that top search result, this is the transcript that you'll see, which you get the basic information for again. You can see from there his offence was larceny, is why he was in, in um, prison, and the prison he was in was in Tullamore in County Offaly. And if I click in to the actual image rather than transcript, you get a bit of extra information which I've highlighted here. So you'll get the physical description, you'll get his occupation, which is labourer, and you'll see his sentence details. So he was in prison for, for three months. Number 13, Petty Sessions Court Registers. So these are kind of like the prison registers in their detail, but they're probably a little less serious. Um, than the prison registers. They are um, exactly what they say. They're petty. So it's petty crimes, domestic disputes, and public order offences are the type of things you'll see recorded in here. But this is the, these are the type of records that they're in the local community in Ireland. So you're going to get an idea of what day-to-day -day life was like in, in the communities around Ireland um, at the time that these records were recorded. So from a genealogy point of view, you'll get things like their names and addresses. You'll get whether they, they, what, what their offence was and what their role is in the particular record, because you'll, as well as defendants, you'll find victims and witnesses in there. Important to know for the petty sessions, there's no records for Dublin City at the moment or for Northern Ireland, but they do cover the rest of Ireland, and it's a massive collection. There's over 20 million records. So if you've got Irish ancestors, I mean, this, this record set time and time again comes up trumps with the results that you can get out of it. So please do have a look at it. Um, here's a look at the um, search page again, and a little tip I put in there is you can actually narrow it down by, so again, a key thing for Irish family history is knowing a location. So if you know uh, the county town or a big town in the county that your ancestor lived in, 
um, you can enter that into the court section because most of the larger towns in Ireland would have had a court. So you can narrow it down to just focus on that community um, by using that specific search field. And the records you can find um, are varied, but here's just a nice example that I've pulled out. Um, it, this, this record is showing somebody in drunk, drunk in charge of an ass and a cart. So you'd be, um, you'd be uh, surprised how often that might happen with the Irish living up to their stereotype of drunken people there. Um, so I just put in a little photograph of what that might look like. That guy looks a little drunk, I think. <laughs> um, moving on, dog license registers. Then these are very similar to the Petty Sessions registers um, in that they were actually applied for in the Petty Sessions Court. So people went into the Petty Sessions Court and applied for their dog license there. Now obviously what you would have to remember about the dog license registers is in rural Ireland, most people would have worked on a farm and most farms would have had a dog. So you're talking about a lot of people. You can see there's 7.3 million records in this record set. So a lot of people will be recorded in here. And again, you're getting vital um, geneolo genealogical information like names and addresses, the year and date of the license. But you'll also get information on their, their canine companions. So you'll find out the color, the sex, and the breed of the dog if you're interested. Um, I've pulled out this example here, which is um, a, do a, a dog license register from Mount Rat in County Leash in 1866. Now, most of the registers, you won't find the dog's names, but the guy who was recording, or girl, who was recording the actual records on this day, obviously decided they wanted to include the dog's names. So we've got a list there under the remarks column of all of the dog's names. So Prince, Captain, Jess, and Watch, which is interesting for a dog's name, um, were popular dog's names in Mount Rath and County Leash in 1866. So again, these are the type of things that you can find out that you won't find in other records. Where else are you going to find out what your ancestor's dog was called? Moving on, um, our poverty relief loans, um, 1821 to 1874. These are another exclusive record set, and they were brought online in partnership with the National Archives in the UK. So there's over 600,000 records, and basically these were loans that people applied for and people who were known as the industrious poor. So if you were, had a bit of land and wanted to um, either grow something on the land or do some work on the land, you could apply for a loan to the government to, to, um, to help you out with, with actually getting work on it. What's great about them as well is you can see from the year range that they cover um, a lot of the 19th century and also the important period of the Irish famine. So if you want to find out what happened or what became of your ancestors, especially in rural Ireland where the famine affected people most, this is a really good record set to have a look at. Um, the type of information you'll get from it, um, names, locations, again, so important for Irish family history, the place, the parish, the county, um, the role of the person, are they a borrower, are they a witness or a guarantor, because what you'll find with these records as well is you'll find, um, as I'll show you an example in a second, you'll find the same person turn up a couple of times as different roles. So he could be a witness for someone else's loan application, but then he could be applying for a loan himself in a different record. And you'll also find out um, their occupation and any details of the loan. So this example that I've pulled out, oh, actually, the counties, the, the counties covering, first of all. Again, as I mentioned, it's mostly rural Ireland. So you'll see um, on the map there the western seaboard and some in the south. So you've got the counties that probably don't have a lot of coverage in other records. So Clare, Cork, Galway, Kerry, Leitrim, Limerick, Mayo, Roscommon, Sligo and Tipperary. If you've got ancestors from any of those counties, I'd advise you to take a look at this record set. The example that I've pulled out here um, kind of shows how you can you find the same person in, in several different entries. So this example is for Joseph Cannon. On the top right hand side, you can see him as a guarantor on someone's loan and on the on the bottom uh, left hand side you'll see him on his own actual um, loan application and he's listed there with his brother Michael Cannon so you're getting kind of families and friends all at the same time in the one record set what's interesting about this guy as well one of the notes um, as a, you can see at the bottom there notes that he goes to America in 1847 so you can imagine that is to escape the famine um, as so many did but also that can kind of if you find that record then you can stop looking for him in Ireland and it, you can redirect your focus to uh, American records moving swiftly on number 16 Ireland national school registers so Alex earlier talked about the, um, the UK school registers and these are very similar albeit a lot smaller so there's 140,000 records in this collection now the one caveat with this record collection is the fact that um, they're probably defunct schools mostly and they tend to be smaller ones in rural areas. So if there's a big school in your town in Ireland at the moment um, that, that's still running, that's probably not going to be listed here. But the information you can get in the records is fantastic. So you can get names and addresses, ages and birth years, the parents' occupations and things like attendance records and exam results. And that's the type of stuff that you won't find anywhere else. It's really interesting to add some um, more context to your ancestor's life.
Um, just a note as well, um, attendance didn't become compulsory in Ireland until 1892, so if you can find your ancestor, in any, even if you know the school that they went to and you still can't find them, or you can find them sporadically throughout the records, that's probably why. Just moving on to the example that I've pulled out now as well. This example is of Mary Carson, and I pulled out this one basically because I wanted to show the information what the register can show. So if you have a look at the what the area that I've highlighted there, it shows Mary Carson is there, but it also shows the school that she last attended was in Antrim. So this school that she's attending is in Cork, so the family at some point have moved from Antrim to Cork. So again, it kind of gives you the, that avenue of research that you might not have realised. So if you see this record set, you can then now direct your research back up to Antrim rather than Cork. On to number 17 on the countdown, and I think I'm, I'm blasting through them okay, so we might have time for questions yeah, as well. Yeah, we're doing all right for time, actually. Great. Um, so this one is a personal favourite of mine, the Dublin Workhouse Collection. Um, having Dublin roots myself, I was delighted to find my ancestors in this record collection because they are so detailed. If you have got Dublin connections, if you've got anyone living in Dublin City in the 19th century or early 20th century, please search this record set because the chances are they probably passed through the workhouses at one, at one um, point or other. So there's over a, a million and a half admission and discharge registers and on top of that you've got nearly a, a million uh, poor law union board of guardians minute books and I'll describe exactly what they are in a moment. Basically this collection documents the poorest members of the community and Dublin at the time was one of the, the poorest cities in, um, the, in Europe so there was tenements so, and there was a lot of homeless people, there was a lot of social um, problems in Dublin at the time, so I, I honestly think that most people in Dublin have probably touched on a workhouse at one time or another. So you've got three different workhouses that the records covered, Dublin North, Dublin South and Rat Down. Um, so what the actual records, the different record sets themselves can reveal. So the admission and discharge registers are just that, they're people entering and leaving the workhouse. You get their names, their ages and their occupations. You'll also find things like their marital status, and their address, their next of kin as well. That's something that I found for my own ancestors actually was I found my great-great-grandmother listed in there, but also a list of her children. So you can get the whole family in one go along with all of their details, so it's fantastic. And the Board of Guardian Minute Books, on the other hand, are more about the day-to-day -day running of the workhouses. So the Board of Guardians are where the people responsible for running the workhouse, and they had weekly meetings, and these are the minute books from those meetings. So you'll find all sorts of stuff in there from what they were ordering in terms of food, um, any work that was being done on the workhouse, staff members, inmates, um, any incidents that took place. So they're kind of a lot more kind of context around the actual people in the workhouse themselves. But again, a, a good source to actually check for, for any extra information. So um, this is the, the record set search page for the uh, Board of Guardian Minute. Board of Guardians Minute Books, and I've just noted there that on the, under the Useful Links and Resources section, you can jump from that into the Admission and Discharge Registers, and that's really useful. So if you find one person in one record set, then you can jump straight away into the, the other record set and search for them in there, because chances are if they're in one, they might be mentioned in the other as well. So this slide kind of gives an idea of the colour and the stories that you can pull out of these, these record sets. Um, in 1854, these records relate to five Brophy children who were abandoned by their mother on South King Street in Dublin. And you can follow their story through the records. So you can see them, they're listed there in the admission and discharge registers. That's a picture of the South Dublin workhouse that they were sent to. But we've also got a smaller record set on the site called Deserted Children Dublin, and they're listed in there as well. So it's always worth checking. Um, several record sets for the same person once you find them. Number 18 on the list is our Church of Ireland parish record search forms. So, so we wouldn't have a huge amount of Church of Ireland records on Find My Past, but this collection is fantastic and it is for Church of Ireland. So there's around 20,000 records in there. Um, these are basically um, forms that were used to uh, verify someone's age when they were applying for the old age pension when it came into um, in, when it was brought out in Ireland in 1909. So again, important to note, it's Church of Ireland only, so the vast majority of the country at this time would have been Catholic, but these, it, these records are, do only relate to Church of Ireland. Um, and they include censuses as well. So what would happen is somebody would apply for the, the, for the old age pension, and the person in the Records Office of Ireland would have to go and check either their parish records or their census records from the 19th century, which hadn't been destroyed at that point, um, to verify their age so that they could approve the claim. The information you can get is fantastic. So you've got names, birth years, parents' names, 
the year, the parish, county, and the type of source, so whether it's a parish record or whether it's a um, census record. You'll also find searcher notes on there, other family members um, and things like that. You'll see from that example on that slide that there's this, the, the person who was searching for the records has listed some stuff on there. So often, if they find um, a, record set, a, rec a record for the person that they're looking for and then they have that record includes pe other people listed, they'll include that on this form as well. This is the search page for the um, Irish, uh, the parish record search forms. And again, I've just noted that you can narrow your search. Um, and the, these fields are, are really useful. And again, go to the specific search page on the site to use these fields. So you can narrow it by event type, which would be whether it's a marriage, a, a baptism, or a census, or the parish. So if you know the parish that your ancestor is in, you can narrow it down that way. And number 19 is our exclusive Irish Quaker collection, which is a fantastic collection of records. Now, obviously, not everyone has Quaker ancestors, but if you do, you're 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 in a lot of luck because these records are fantastic. And um, we've got over 1.7 million of them, and they include births, marriages, and deaths, congregational records, which is the largest set, school records, and migration records. And um, a couple of fantastic things about this collection is that they date all the way back to the 1600s, and also the Quakers are known for keeping really detailed really meticulous records. So you'll see an example here that I've pulled out. This was from one of our members who sent in a discovery actually um, that they found their um, Irish Quaker ancestor. His name was William Neville and he lived in Mount Mellick in County Leash. So there, that's what we've entered into the search. And the results are these records. So you can see the top on the top right hand side I've just highlighted the marriage. So this is a marriage from William Neville to Elizabeth Pleadwell, um, but on the marriage certificate you get the bride's name and residence, you get the bride's parents' names, you get the groom's details, and you get the date of the marriage. Standard stuff for a, a marriage a record, but what's, what you don't get on other marriage records is a whole list of all the attendees at the wedding. So imagine how many people you can add to your family tree by just looking at this one record set. And finally, on my list of um, 10 fantastic unmissable resources for Irish family history is some of our exclusive county collections. So obviously, if you've gotten to the point where you know your ancestors from a particular county in Ireland, you want to zone in on records from that particular county. I've just to chosen two today to highlight, which are exclusive to Final Pass, and they're County Sligo and <coughs> County Clare. So for County Sligo and County Clare, we've got a mix of fantastic exclusive records, including workhouse records, directories, electoral registers, and government records. Now, the reason I've pulled these out as well is because they're they're more rural than other counties, less urban, and again, the coverage for records in general is probably not as good, so these are really, really useful if you do have ancestors from either of those counties. Looking into, into them in a bit more detail, County Clare, we've got um, Board of Guardians minute books, again, just like the ones I talked about for the Dublin workhouses. These look after the day-to-day -day running of the Clare workhouses, which are Ennis Tymon and Kilrush. So we've also got a browsable collection, which means you can go in and just go through a page by page if you like. But yeah, all sorts of stuff that you would find in the Board Guardian Minute books about the inmates, about the staff, about anyone who was hired or fired from the workhouse will all be listed in there. Clare County Government Proceedings. Now this is basically what we would call in Ireland today the County Council. So um, it stretches back to 1732 and all the way up to 1882, and there's over 7,000 records in there. It is a PDF search, so like Alex talked about earlier, it works on OCR, so you would be, it's a name search really that you would be running on in, in this. Um, anyone who served on the grand jury will be listed in there, as well as anybody that was hired by the grand jury to carry out any work, they'll be listed in there as well. And Clare Electoral Registers, so we've over 300,000 records in that set, um, ranging from 1860 to 1910. You'll find males and females in there, and you get the important genealogical information like names and addresses. So again, for the 19th century in Ireland, where there's no census records, that could be a really useful census substitute. Moving on to County Sligo. So we've got workhouse um, records from County Sligo. Um, there's over 9,000 of them. And as you saw with the Dublin workhouse records, they are extensively detailed. Um, over 3,000 of those 9,000 records include children. So, I mean, if you're looking for children in County Sligo, um, these are really good. And the fantastic thing about them, of course, is it predates uh, civil registration, which started in 1864 in Ireland. So they, these go from 1848 to 1859. So if you can't find someone because you, their parish records don't exist or something for Sligo, this, um, these records, the workhouse records, might be able to fill that gap for you. 
There's also a couple of directories from Sligo that are exclusive to Find My Past, and that one from the Independent newspaper and one from the Chronicle. So it's basically with directories, you've got lists of businesses, lists of tradespeople, um, the gentry, county administrations, the, the history of the town and things like that. So if your family member had a, had a business in Sligo, there's every chance you can find them in those record sets. So I think we have come to our finish. And I have one last top tip on that one, actually. Um, <laughs> The A to Z of record sets, and this this actually applies. Yeah, this is a big one. Yeah, this applies for everything, so it's a good one to end on. It applies to all of the record sets we've gone through today, and any record set you're interested in. I've just taken it in terms of the context for for um, county collections. I've typed in Dublin into the A to Z of record sets, and every record set with Dublin in its name comes up. So basically, whatever you're searching for, go to the A to Z of record sets, type it in, and if we have anything from to do with that um, particular topic or place or whatever it is that you're typing in. Um, it will come up and you can access the specific search screens from there. So it's the easiest way to get exactly what you're looking for. Okay, I think we have time for maybe a couple of questions. We we are at our hour, but I think we can extend out the yeah. webinar by a couple of minutes right, and ask, ask a few questions. So I'm going to pass um, you back to Alex, who has a couple of questions lined up for me, I think, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Thanks, no, I, I need to lie down now. <laughs> we did it. We actually got through 20 record sets in an hour, despite my best efforts to derail. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks for it. Do you know what? I think, I think, this, I think we make quite a team. We'll be, we'll be, the, we'll be the, the, the Ant and Deck of the genealogy world in no time, I'm sure of it. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. We do, we do hope that um, this, has been able to, uh, this has been helpful. We've actually used a slightly new um, template for our slides. Um, so yeah, give us feedback. Let us know what you thought. Um, and yeah, feel free to let us know of any ways you think we could improve. We're constantly looking to. So Max, Max Anderson, who normally films the Facebook Fridays, um, is still looking into microphones. So soon we will be speaking to you in crystal clear HD, we hope. But uh, yeah, so anyway, questions for Niall. I've picked some out here for you, Niall. Um, we'll probably, probably only get to do one or two each, won't we? So I'll... Okay, right. How about... Ah. This is quite a, this is a good one, actually. Um, this is from Lois Farley Shufford. Um, hello, Lois. Um, are, and, and Lois has asked, um, are evictions covered by any of our Irish record sets and the land clearances? And yeah, interesting question, um, Lois. Uh, specifically on Flying by Past, we don't have anything specifically about evictions. But the thing about land records in Ireland is, in the 19th century, that's what you're going to be using for a census substitute. So land records in general rather than specifically evictions we have records for so you've got the main one which is griffith's valuation you've got the ones that i touched on like the land of the state court rentals and the irish poverty relief loans to look at so there are land records but nothing specific to evictions now of course they might exist uh, but i can only really talk to the ones that i know that are on fine my past and i know that we don't have any specific for evictions but if you're looking for someone to just pinpoint them in a in a certain place use the land records Cool. Shall I give, I'll give you another one. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to add. One of the best things about having an actual Irishman giving this is the correct pronunciation of Irish place names, because I always make such a hash of that. Um, so, yeah, well, well question number two. Um, this one is from Sandra Miles. Um, quite a broad general one, um, but good question to ask. So Sandra would like to know if there are any records specifically listing passengers who sailed from Ireland to Britain? Yeah, this one comes up quite a lot, actually, Sandra, and the, the, it depends on the time that you're talking about, but in general, if it's back in the 19th century, you have to remember that Ireland was part of Britain at the time, so they didn't record movements between the, because it was the same country. So in general, the answer is no. Um, obviously, as you get later and, and Ireland becomes independent, you will then obviously have passenger lists. But the short answer for the 19th century and beyond that is, is no. Um, I've got a couple of questions for Alex lined up as well that I want to ask. Easy ones, Niall. Oh, of course. <laughs> I know how you can talk, Alex. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this question came in from Amy Al Allwood, and Amy asks, how late do bands records go? Oh, I mean, that... It depends collection to collection, really. Um, I'd say, as a general rule, a lot of them go up to... Oh, do you know what? I can't even say off the top of my head when they generally go up to. Um, yeah, it, it does vary cap by county, county by county, collection by collection. So I'd say your best bet, really, is identifying the area that you want to look in. Going to, as Niall mentioned earlier, go to our A to Z. 
um, and see what comes up. And the date ranges are very often included in the record set titles. Um, if it's not included in the title, um, another top tip, this is just a general one really, um, when you're on a search page, if it's a specific search page for that record set, always scroll down past the search form because lots of people miss it, but at the very bottom of the search form, you'll find all this contextual information which will tell you everything you need to know about the set. So in this case, you know, you might find dates for when, when coverage ends, but you know, you'll, you'll also find a bit of historical background into the history of those records and why they were taken and who took them. Uh, you'll also get some tips on how to search them and also a brief overview of what you'll find in there. So, yeah, I'd always recommend scrolling to the bottom of the search page and seeing what's there. But in terms to when band, our, our collections of bands run up to, um, yeah, there's no general year, really. It kind of varies by collection to collection. So just have a look and see what's there. I asked that one on purpose just to catch him out. <laughs> um, one more question for Alex before we finish up because we have over Iran. Um, and this is a 1939 register question and it's come in from Elaine Ballard. And Elaine is asking, are the redacted records in, 1930, in, in the 1939 register automatically released when appropriate? Yes, we have. We, ha we actually have been doing that. So wh while you can also hurry the process along if you spot... A record that you shouldn't, that you don't think should be redacted, um, or you're pretty sure your your ancestors in that household, and you want to get it opened up. You can hurry the process along by filling in those forms on the website. But at the same time, we are also continuously going through and opening records as, as and when we can. So whenever we, whenever we, whenever we've reached a bit of a milestone, I think the last one was that we 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 added an additional five million or something. Well, you know, which is which is a lot of records when you think about it. Um, we we will we will announce that. So you know, we'll we'll put out a press release and we'll send you an email to let you know. So yeah, watch this space. The thirty nine register is continuously growing and will continue to do so. Um, so yeah, I guess do you think should we, should we wrap it up? Yeah. I'll pass back to Niall. Yeah, that's pretty much it for today, folks. Um, hopefully, um, you don't mind us overrunning. I suppose, as you can see on the record sets that we touched on, we could do a, a whole webinar around some of them. They're they're that intricate and that detailed. Um, any any webinar, any uh, your feedback that you have, or anything that you'd like us to cover in future webinars, please let us know. Also, what we'll do is any questions that we haven't got through today, um, between myself, Alex, and the team that have been answering them as we go. Um, we'll take a look at for um, Facebook Live this coming Friday, so we'll round up some of the questions that we didn't get through and we'll address them at that. So if you want to tune into that, that'll be this Friday afternoon, um, British time, on, on Facebook. So, come join me. Yeah, come join Alex, the face of Friday. <laughs> so yeah, that's it folks. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it um, and I hope you join us again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.